Welcome to Speculative Sandbox, your audio playground for creative storytellers. We're currently batch recording our upcoming episodes, so I've asked some friends to take care of the podcast in a limited author takeover series. You'll recognize them as former guests on the show, so you'll be in good hands. I look forward to chatting again soon. Where does a story start? Well, in most cases, a story starts at the beginning, of course. But sometimes it starts before the beginning. Or maybe it starts somewhere at the end, and then goes to the beginning. And if you're the one writing the story, the story starts before the words are ever put to paper. But where in the story do you actually start writing? My name is Matthew C. Brown, and in this episode of Speculative Sandbox's Author Takeover series, I'll be talking about beginnings. From prologues to chapter ones, this is where we start our stories and why. When the real world just doesn't cut it, let's get lost in a fictional one. Right now, I'm going to read an excerpt from the screenplay for The Devil Wears Prada, but this is not the final draft. This is an older draft with a different opening than the one we see in the final film. Fade in. Interior. Chateau. France. Day. An elegant 17th century mansion a short distance from Paris. A dinner is set for about a hundred people. Everything is perfect. Exquisite flowers, linens, silver. Anyone who's anyone in the fashion world is there. We see Lagerfeld, Valentino, Mark Jacobs. Nigel Kipling, a dapper man in his late 30s slash early 40s, speaks at a podium at the center of the dais on one side of the room. Our POV is from someone else on the dais, so we see Nigel from the back. Nigel. Her name has become legend. Her magazine is the Bible for anyone interested in style, taste, and sophistication. Without a doubt, one of the most elegant women ever to walk the planet, I give to you Miranda Priestley. Loud applause rings out, and from the back, we see Miranda Priestley approaching the podium. We can only make out her fancy updo, the curves of her couture gown. As Miranda lingers, taking in the applause, we reverse to see whose point of view we are watching from. Andy Barnes, 20s, pretty, elegantly put together. She stands a few feet behind Miranda. She applauds, smiling. Some of Miranda's light spills onto Andy. Miranda starts to talk, and we hear a brief screech of feedback. The screech dissolves into... Flashback to... Exterior. Midtown Street. Day. The screech of a taxi, rounding a corner. Six months earlier, Annie walks out of a subway station, clutching a piece of paper with directions on it. Now, if you've seen the movie, I think it's clear why they didn't go with this opening. It's superfluous. What does this prologue accomplish in setting up the story that the revised opening scene doesn't? In the final film, a musical montage introduces us to the main character, Andy, and compares her morning routine with other women. She's not as glamorous, her clothing is less fancy, and she's way more flustered. Right away we learn she's an underdog, a small fish in a big pond, and she's gunning for a dream job. It's pretty clear that we don't need a prologue six months in the future. We can just start where the story starts. In a book, we'd call that chapter one. So that begs the question... Why start with a prologue instead of chapter one? It's a common way to start a story, but what's your first thought when you hear the word prologue? There's a subtle communication happening between author and reader when a book starts with a prologue. It's striking a match and lighting a candle in a dark room. It's the overture from a pit orchestra before the curtains come up. In short, a prologue is ambiance. You're setting a tone, introducing a character, or laying out the groundwork for a new world before inviting the reader into it. One of the most famous prologues in film is Raiders of the Lost Ark. What do we learn in the opening scene? First and foremost, we meet our hero, Indiana Jones. In a short amount of time, we learn he's a cunning archaeologist on the hunt for a golden idol. Second, a mood is set for the story. This is an adventure rife with danger, betrayal, and booby traps. Third, we see our hero fail. Yep, Indiana Jones fails to retrieve the idol after his rival takes it from him. 
So 10 minutes into the movie, we know the capability of our hero, we know the type of story we're getting into, and perhaps most importantly, we're given a reason to root for him. We are invested. Could the story have started out elsewhere? Sure. The real story starts when Jones is in his classroom and army intelligence tells him the Nazis are planning to steal the Ark of the Covenant. But that's not a very exciting scene. In fact, it would be flat out boring if we didn't get the prologue. Of course, it does get exciting later, but telling someone the good stuff comes later might then make them wonder why they wouldn't just start with the good stuff. The prologue for Raiders of the Lost Ark is a preview of that good stuff and a promise of what's to come. Now, I'm not saying that beginnings always need to be action-packed. In fact, sometimes it can be detrimental. Why start a book with a big fight scene if you don't know the stakes or have no connection to the characters? What if you're writing a story in a sci-fi fantasy world and you're not ready to introduce your main character just yet? Maybe you need some background to your world. Maybe there is some story before the story. An example of this is in Brandon Sanderson's The Way of Kings, which features three prologues. Yes, three. The first is titled Prelude, and shows a scene set thousands of years before the events of the book. And frankly, it's kind of confusing and doesn't make much sense until later when you learn about the world that the book is set in. Then the prologue plays out in a more Raiders style. We meet an assassin on his way to kill a king, we learn a little bit about him, his magical abilities, and we get a better idea of what kind of story we're getting into. And then there's chapter one, which is told from a point of view of a common soldier whose sole purpose is to witness the introduction of the main character, Kaladin, a skilled military leader. And then, spoiler alert, that soldier dies at the end of the chapter. Sure, it sounds pointless to introduce a character and then kill them immediately, but Sanderson points out that an easy way to make your main character seem cool and awesome is to see them through another's eyes. Now, I'm not here to tell you that you need to do three prologues. In fact, you shouldn't. Even Sanderson acknowledges the only reason he got away with starting the book this way is because he already had some established clout. But taken individually, these three are still good examples of different types of prologues. A mood setter, an engaging conflict, and an introduction to how cool your main character is. Sometimes a prologue might be set at the end of the story so as to create intrigue, presenting a situation that makes us ask, what's going on? And then rewinding to the beginning to answer the question. This might have been the intention of the original opening to The Devil Wears Prada, but we've already established why it wasn't necessary. That opening doesn't prompt many worthwhile questions. The film Inception starts with the main character, Cobb, washed up on a beach with nothing but a gun and a spinning top. Then he meets an old man who asks if he's there to kill him. But how did Cobb get there? Is he in Japan? What's the point of the top? Why does this old man think Cobb is there to kill him? And then we cut to the beginning of the story, loaded with questions, hoping to have them answered. So when we finally reach this scene at the end of the movie, it makes much more sense. So we've talked about what makes a good prologue, but let's go back to why not every story needs one. It's true, we don't always need to set the mood or show the beginning before the beginning. Some people, from casual readers to industry professionals, see prologue at the start of the story and it puts them off right away because it sends the message that the story doesn't actually start here. And let's face it, that's true in many cases, as we've seen in previous examples, even the good ones. Is that fair to you, the budding author? No. Is it true all the time? Of course not. But it's the cold reality of starting out writing. So think back to the beginning of The Devil Wears Prada and ask yourself, what's wrong with starting on chapter one? I think chapter one, as opposed to prologue, sends the message that we are getting right into the story. Yes, character, mood, and plot still need to be established, but that one difference in title sends a message to the reader. And look, I love prologues. They can be very cool. Raiders of the Lost Ark has a great prologue. The James Bond movies have great prologues. But sometimes stories don't benefit much from any kind of preamble. Let's take the book Dune, for example. There could have been some kind of prologue for Dune. In 1984 and 2021, the film versions, they both feature one. But the book doesn't. Instead, it jumps right into the scene of Paul and the Gum Jabbar. 
Sure, there are a lot of names, terms, and backstory thrown around that we don't understand right away, but we do meet Paul and see him put in a situation of life or death. It's tense, gets us to care about him, and makes us eager to learn just what the hell is going on. Sure, Frank Herbert could have included a prologue about the history of Arrakis that would accomplish some world-building and maybe set the tone, but that just wouldn't be quite as gripping as seeing your main protagonist shoved into danger only ten pages into your book. Other example of a book that could have had a prologue is The Martian by Andy Weir. Right off the bat, our narrator Mark Watney states just how screwed he is, and every sentence makes us ask questions, and every answer leads to more questions. Over time, we learn more about the Ares program and how Watney came to be stranded on Mars. Andy Weir didn't want to front-load his book with technical jargon that might turn off a reader that doesn't normally like hard science fiction. He puts the character first. No preamble, just one person with a big problem. But let's say you do want to set the board a bit before you get to your actual story. But you don't want to call it a prologue. The answer is simple. Just call it Chapter 1. The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang starts in a prologue-like way. Our main character Rin is just about to start an intense exam that will determine whether she gets to attend an esteemed military academy. Then we back up a bit to some time before the exam and learn a bit about Rin's backstory and why this exam is so important. Kuang could have taken the first part of Chapter 1 and made it her prologue, and it probably would have been effective, but would it have been necessary? Instead, she presents a very effective first chapter that starts with a tense situation. It gets our attention, rewinds a bit to tell us more about our main character and her problem, and then we watch her work to overcome that problem. That's only the first chapter of the book. What's also noteworthy is that the next two books in Kwong's trilogy feature prologues detailing events before the main story. But much like Sanderson's three prologues, if you're reading these books, then you're already invested in the author, so... Kwong can exercise some flexibility in her storytelling. Before I move on, I want to touch on slow beginnings versus fast beginnings, because I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea about what beginnings should be. A lot of the examples I've talked about have exciting beginnings, action and conflict right off the bat, the main character's introduction, maybe even explosions. But I want to give a nod to slow beginnings, the ones that take a bit more time to unfold, the ones that you may feel uncertain about writing because you're afraid of being boring. I'm going to compare the first 20 minutes of two different movies, Star Wars, A New Hope, and Inglorious Bastards. The first 20 minutes of A New Hope consists of the following, a title crawl which acts as a sort of prelude, a space battle, a shootout between rebels and imperial forces, Introduction of two droids, introduction of the damsel in distress, introduction of the villain, some peril for the droids, and then an introduction for the main character. And let's not forget the bellicose music, explosions, and lasers on the way. I think it's safe to say the first 20 minutes of Star Wars are exciting, and even though we don't meet the main character until the end of those 20 minutes, it's engaging and gets us hooked into the conflict right away. Compare that to Inglorious Bastards, where the first 20 minutes, titled Chapter 1, I might add, is taken up by one scene. The scene serves as an extensive introduction to the villain, Hans Landa, who's on the hunt for a Jewish family, who happened to be hiding under the floorboards right below him. It's a slow burn kind of scene, almost entirely focused on just two characters in one room. There's no music or action of any sort until the scene's climax. But if you've seen the movie, you know that scene. And the scene, while slow, is anything but boring. The scene is all about tension, it shows just how cunning the villain is, and when the sole surviving member of the Jewish family makes her escape, there's a promise that she and the villain will meet again. Now, I'm aware that I'm comparing two different movies from two different directors at two different stages of their careers, George Lucas had something to prove with Star Wars, and Tarantino had more established clout when Inglorious Bastards came out. The point still stands, slow beginnings have a place, whether it's a character introduction or setting a mood. If your story has a slow beginning, but you know that it's how you want your story to start, keep it that way. Write honestly. We've compared and contrasted prologue and chapter 1, we've talked about what makes a good prologue and why chapter 1 is a better place to start sometimes. 
Now, what about actually writing your story? Where do you start? A lot of that is going to depend on the kind of writer you are. Some are outliners, some are discovery writers who write and figure it out as they go, and some fall in between. I'm sure most of you start at the beginning of the book. Maybe not the first chapter or prologue, but certainly act one. Or maybe you write the first scene that comes fully formed in your head. Some might write scenes out of order, especially if you're an outliner. For me personally, I'm more of a discovery writer, meaning I don't do a lot of detailed outlining before I start writing. I usually have a very basic roadmap highlighting plot points, A, B, C, and so on. I sometimes have scenes in mind as well, and I tend to write my scenes in chronological order, but sometimes I skip what I think my first scene should be. For example, in my most recent manuscript, the first scene I wrote was an introduction to the main character and the conflict. That makes perfect sense for a first chapter, but in the back of my mind, I had a feeling that this wasn't my first real chapter. But I wasn't ready to write it yet. Later on, when I finished the book, I went back and wrote what is now chapter one. And that first scene I wrote is now chapter two. So why didn't I start the book with what I think my first chapter should be? Simply put, I think that no matter where you actually start writing your story, you're going to have to go back at some point and take a good look at your beginning and ask yourself some questions. Does your story start in the right place? Is that prologue necessary, or were you just feeling out the start of your book? I think that question in particular is relevant to writers like myself who don't do as much outlining. Also ask yourself, are you setting the right tone for your book? Are you making promises that are kept later on? You may have to rewrite parts of your first chapter, or maybe you'll have a prologue you want to remove completely. Or maybe you don't need to change anything at all. After everything I've talked about, I have to acknowledge a simple truth. Beginnings can be scary. If you're starting a book, staring down the road of however many thousands of words, it's daunting. V.E. Schwab, author of The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, writes the words, This is how it starts, at the beginning of every new manuscript. She says, quote, When I sit down with the bones of a new idea, these are the words I write at the top of the page so it's no longer blank. A reminder that in the beginning, I am not writing a book, I'm simply telling a story to myself. However you start your story, whether it's a prologue or chapter one, fast or slow, an action set piece or a mood setting, make sure you do start your story. It doesn't have to start perfectly, but you do have to start. And you can always go back and make it better later. Thank you for listening to this episode of Speculative Sandbox's author takeover series with me, Matthew C. Brown. If you like the sound of a sci-fi western with velociraptors, check out my short story, Pepperdam Luck, Tales from Ekis 6. Clint Pepperdam is good at cheating at cards, just not indefinitely. When his getaway plan goes wrong, he finds himself stranded in the middle of the desert with an angry gang hot on his trail. His luck is already bad, and there's a high chance it's going to get worse. This story is available to read in text or audio form on my website, mattbrownwrites.com. That's Pepperdam Luck, Tales from Ekis 6 on mattbrownwrites.com. If you missed my previous chats with Vicky on the show, you can find me on the following episodes. Am I the Drama? Shared Universes, and Fighting Words. Speculative Sandbox is a volunteer-run podcast that relies on the collaboration of fellow creators like you. Join the conversation and participate in fun polls and questionnaires on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Interested in being in a future episode? Our DMs are open, or you can email speculativesandbox at gmail.com.